Okay, my name is Evan Scheibel with CG Toots Plus, and in this tutorial, we're going to take a look at View 6 Extreme, uh, specifically a few pinpointed kind of aspects of the software in order to get a good production workflow for like huge epic landscape scenes. Um, so what you see right here is kind of the example for the scene that we're going to be working on. Now I'm going to do this tutorial, however, just a tad bit differently uh, than normal for me because I'm not going to create this scene in real time. What I'm uh, going to do instead is just explain all the processes that I took to get to this finished result uh, because this scene right here took a lot of just kind of tedious tweakings of all the different settings um, that to do again in real time would be uh, it, it would just take up too much time. So rather than that, what I'm going to do is pack a lot more information into this tutorial and hopefully allow you to go away with enough knowledge of view uh, to not only make this scene, but to continue on past this and make even better uh, better looking things. So uh, anyway, let's get started. First I'll kind of describe what you see here and then we'll kind of go through all the little settings and the different things like that along the way. So, um, okay, so right here what you see is um, just three different pieces of terrain and then you can't really see it too well, uh, but underneath these clouds here there's another uh, piece of terrain. Now this looks like a huge expanse. Uh, it, it's, it uses what's called in view infinite terrain. Now it's actually not as big as you would think. Um, so that's one of the things that we're going to look at specifically in this tutorial is how to fake humongous looking scenes but yet keep the poly count low enough where it won't crash mid-level machines. Um, this still is th um, 36 billion polygons but Vue is really good with handling uh, large poly counts like that. So this really probably couldn't be translated into other any other software except for Vue as the extreme plugin for Max I'm not even sure would handle something like this um, because beneath these clouds here is a whole nother populated ecosystem with a whole bunch of trees and different things like that which all are you know create more polygons so I think it would give Max some trouble if you tried to use the extreme plugin but it works fine in Vue because of the OpenGL capabilities of the software so you should be all right, uh, you know, up to hundreds and hundreds of billions of polygons. So anyway, that's what we're going to look at is how to fake huge expanses. We'll also look at the basics and some more advanced techniques with the Echo system and the Atmosphere Creator. Because actually what you see here, if you look right below, if you can see, and the compression isn't too bad, you, you can see underneath, right beneath these clouds is trees. And what I tried to go for in this scene was kind of the look of kind of mist, uh, some haze maybe, and just thick fog hanging right above the cloud levels, and then having these mountains poke up through. Um, and it achieved that pretty well with a really interesting workaround because Vue actually doesn't really have a good fog system. At least I'm using Vue 6 Extreme. I really don't have the money nor the uh, motivation to upgrade. Um, so I've just stuck with this and it's, it's served me well. And it, at least not that I found, there's really not a good fog system. Uh, so I found a really interesting workaround to fake that which is the uh, the other thing we'll look at. Um, it only really works for small animations and still scenes, which you'll see why when we get to it. And then also we'll look briefly at the, well, in that regard, we'll look at the atmosphere editor, but also we'll look at how to create that fog layer as well as a high level, as you can see in the image here, atmosphere to kind of make that fake a little hidden. And then you'll, you can see here you've got the, the ice rings on the, on the sun. And so we'll look at all the different things that go into making a scene like this, but we, I won't be creating it in real time. But regardless of that, you'll be able to do it on your own. So here's the scene in view. And um, now you can see right off the bat something that I've done differently. Um, if you're familiar with view at all, than most people do. Um, you can see here that all of my terrain is lifted up off the ground. Um, so you can see this line right here is the ground line. That's where like if you were to create stock terrain or, or stock fractal terrains or anything like that they would be created on this line right here. Now but like I said before 
we I wanted to fake a really dense layer of fog right above the, the tree line on the ground in this scene. So what I've done is I've lifted all of my terrain off that ground and into the clouds. Um, now the atmosphere editor in view is very powerful. Um, you can create you know photorealistic stuff fairly easily. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is, is randomness. Uh, because if we go to, into the atmosphere editor and we look at what my settings are um, there's a lot of randomness and a lot of things that um, a new user of view can easily fall into uh, to, to you know even though it looks good it might not necessarily be completely photoreal um, in other words you want it in, in nature there's a ton of randomness you're not gonna find too much uniformity at all so what you want to do is make sure you have um, especially you see how I have two layers of, of clouds here and I've made sure that there if we look back in the picture I've made sure that there's not too much of just like a, a th one thick white blanket nor is there too many holes there's a lot of just uh, natural looking uh, randomness in those clouds so that's kind of your aim and your goal uh, because I've noticed a lot of times when I work on these landscape scenes you know something that looks good to my eye might not actually look real that's because you just spend time in nature and you'll see what I mean because a lot of the times when you make something on a computer you, you might like the way the shadows look uh, but if you go outside and actually look the shadows actually don't look like that um, I've done that numerous times you can go to the CG Society and see my many of my old view uh, works and you'll see that they they look good but they don't look real so it all depends on what you're going for and we're going for photorealism here so um, you can see I have the thin high altitude now even though it's called thin high altitude if you look at my altitude setting you'll see that it's quite low in fact it's all the way down well pretty much all the way down I set it at 105 um, that's just above the lowest it can go now over here if I make this bigger you can see a real-time updated preview and kind of get a glimpse at what it's going to look in the final render. I'm not going to do too many renders here. I'm just going to explain things as I go because it view takes a while to render. But you can see how if I bring this up, you watch how much that changes. You see, now there's no no clouds there. They're above the camera. And in this specific scene, we're not working with um really we're not working by scale because we've got things lifted up and, and, and things all over the place when it comes to that we're working on more of an artistic level in this specific scene so we want to keep that in mind because you know 3.4 kilometers is actually you know in our scene it's not 3.4 kilometers so I've got that quite low so it represents fog um, because if you remember I lifted these up so you can't bring the cloud layer all the way down to the ground at least not with the clouds that I've worked with here which yield the best results I've found for this specific application so thin high altitude is the cloud layer that I use I brought it down to about 105 meters um, and that brings it um, and it all depends too if you bring your your terrain up higher you just have to tweak around that and figure out um, where it works best for your specific scene now that's really the trick to faking this huge looking scene because if you look here it just looks like an expanse but really I deleted my ground plane because it just if you look here my ground it really doesn't do anything um, I didn't delete it but it's it's not really visible at all because what I used for my ground was actually this here I called it ground terrain which and the reason I did that is because I can apply an ecosystem to the default or I can't apply an ecosystem to the default ground layer but I can however apply an ecosystem to uh, you know a generated terrain so what I did is I just created a terrain and flattened it out and, and kind of spread it out so it could take up a lot and then added the ecosystem that I wanted which we'll look at in a, in a few minutes uh, to that so that way when I bring the clouds down it looks like there's actual an, actually an infinite terrain of trees there but in fact it's not because if you look here as things go off in the distance you can only see the trees poking out a little back here but it looks as if these trees right here just extend into the distance and never stop 
Um, so that's a really good trick to get expansive looking scenes that are actually very comparatively low on the poly counts. Um, okay, so that's, uh, that's the atmosphere uh, trick that I used in this specific scene. So let's just take a look. All these different um, settings are pretty self-explanatory. Altitude, I already kind of demonstrated what that does in this render here, render preview here. Height, now what the height does, altitude is the is the um, the altitude of the entire cloud layer, but the height, however, is the is the I guess you could say the thickness of the cloud layer. So whatever altitude you have those clouds at, that's where the bottom of the cloud layer will be. The height, however, will determine how high those clouds rise up, or I guess you could say where the top of that cloud layer will be. So I have mine quite low because I just want it to represent a fog layer, which is uh, usually not going to extend up past the tree line, or, or at least too far past the trees, depending on what time of morning it is or what time of evening it is. So I have it quite low, just nine meters, and um, so that's like I said, the th kind of the thickness of the uh, of the cloud layer. So nine point seven one I found is a, is about right for this application. Now the covering, if you look right here in this box, it'll give you kind of a rough example of what you're dealing with. Now the the cover is, I guess you could say, in meteorological terms, the cloud cover. Uh, so right now the cloud cover is at 73%. If we bring that down, you'll see here, you know, there's really nothing to it. If we bring it up, you know, it, it changes. And it's pretty sensitive as you get into these, these higher settings, as you can see. But that's just the cover ratio of the, of the clouds and the clear sky. So depending on where you set that will depend on how many clouds and how thick those clouds are. Uh, in your in your sky density is um if you were to think of them as like cotton balls well if you rip a cotton ball apart and you just spread it way out it's not as dense and you can see through it and it's a lot more wispy um so you can think of the density setting just like that um the more dense but but this is a weird thing if you have that density setting at 100 percent they're actually in this case they seem to be more wispy and that also will depend on your opacity setting as well. So these two work hand in hand. If you have a low density, like let's say way down here, if you look in the render update, you can see they're less dense. You might want to bring your opacity setting up just because it will give your clouds um, it will allow you to see them and to see that wispy detail that you put in there a lot nicer uh, and you won't lose that that kind of beauty in the cloud layer so if we do a preview render with these settings which I kinda like actually you'll see what we've changed so now it looks just kind of like a light fog rather than a thick heavy dense fog which is nice if that's what you're going for uh, but for this scene I, I wanted a thicker more dense looking low cloud level fog that you would see going through a mountain pass or, or something like that and so that looks alright but it just exposes too much of the uh, kind of half-hearted ecosystem that I put into the ground because you couldn't see it so I, I left that quite high the density quite high and the opacity about 70 ish which is good for this and um, now the detail amount is let's say you have very dense clouds the detail amount is, um, well, the best way I can explain it is if you're working with digital sculpting at all, you have to, one thing to keep in mind is you're, you're not sculpting essentially with the, the, the mesh itself. You're actually sculpting with light uh, because if you move and, and, and shape the, the mesh around, it will look entirely different depending on the lighting. Um, it might look good in one lighting setup, but if you change it into a different lighting setup, what you just did would look horrible. Uh, so the detail amount essentially is the same concept. Uh, you have a lighting setup in your scene, and depending on your detail amount setting will depend on how much the light actually interacts with all of the small little details that you've put in the clouds. So you can see up here you've got quite a bit, but if we take that out, you can see now it just looks like flat nothing. 
it's it's taken the detail out of your cloud layer uh, now it just looks like a blanket and it doesn't react as much or as well with the lighting and different things like that so usually quite high um, is what you're gonna go for it and it all depends on your your setting your scene um, I guess your budget time wise and just different things like that and and also how capable your machines are of rendering um, because a lot of times with with large animations you have to distribute the rendering and things little tweakings like this will slow your render down quite a quite a large amount uh, depending on what you what you use it for and, and your in your sky and things like that which brings me to an interesting point along the render line rendering render settings line um, you have you have like four different different kinds of environments or atmospheres up here um, most of the time you'll find yourself using the spectrum model usually I found it to be the most realistic um, however there is other applications where you might want to use um, what are they called again uh, this certain cloud here and you have to use the volumetric cloud the volumetric model for the atmosphere in order to use certain clouds and just different things like that um, so really I've never really found I've had to use environment mapping or standard usually I'm in spectral just for what I do but um, these spectral usually tends to render a lot slower for some reason because the clouds are a lot more realistic and in a, a lot slower on the render consequently okay so the detail amount like I said and like I showed you it just it just um, toggles how much or how little uh, lighting reaction I guess you could say holes in the clouds and things like that now the altitude variation is similar and it works hand in hand with the detail amount um, and as you tweak this you'll see more and more what it does but essentially it's pretty self-explanatory um, up here you have the altitude and height which I explained um, now that makes th that adjusts the thickness of the cloud layer now the altitude variation will adjust the different variations of a height within that layer so it's not going to put them outside of your of your designated cloud layer area but what it's going to do is just make higher variations of height and altitude uh, within that cloud layer so usually quite high is the way you want it and I'll just bottom it out so you can see the difference up here in this now it's pretty flat and, and just not very good looking there's really nothing for the light to react to uh, regarding detail in the cloud layer so it's just um, doesn't usually look good low unless you're going for something specific so I usually keep it quite high and you'll see the difference up here and I hope you guys can see this in the in the render preview um, I can do another render here but anyhow you understand the concept and what I'm talking about so with that said uh, we'll move on to the flares now this is another cloud type um, to add different cloud types you just click add here and you can go through all of the different types of cloud layers that you have um, spectral like I said renders slow because there's lots of detail lots of realism and uh, you can see just from the example images the difference between say spectral and stratus you can you can see there's a huge difference because there's actually volume to these where these are more based around images and uh, if you're familiar with game development at all these would be more like a skybox um, whereas spectral actually has three dimensions uh, very very vividly so and you can do much more with these so all your different cloud layers are here and you'll see that I used flare for these high ones and now if you look again in my image these high wispy clouds is that flare cloud layer now that's kind of the trick into actually tricking people into believing that this is a fog layer is to have another high atmospheric kind of layer way up here that looks as if there's still actually a sky present when in fact the sky is down here so lots of little tricks and workarounds like that um, that most people don't think of most people will jump into a software application like this and just think they have to work within its boundaries but that's actually as we've seen here that's not the case um, if you stretch the boundaries just a bit you can get some very very interesting results from uh, you know that most people wouldn't come to so 
you that's my layer up here is that flare layer now all the settings you know there's different things grayed out as you can see because it's a, it's not a spectral cloud layer it's actually a cirrus i think cloud layer if you come in here stratus cirrus and then you've got all the different ones here i think one of these would be the flare but anyway it's just it's not as you have a lot of these options are not available because it's not a spectral layer so um there's a lot less to deal with usually everything's about half or maximum which is usually about good but you can see because it's a because it's a cirrus layer you have a lot more altitude to work with so i have it about half um because cirrus clouds are normally very high and very wispy and uh so i have it about half because that that was just the setting that worked right um for this specific scene so um that's the trick to faking this large looking atmosphere um is is that you know right there without that this scene would be dead and it wouldn't look good at all all right um now the sun it's it's just uh if you go to atmosphere load atmosphere it's actually this spectral sunset um just i think uh yeah just the the stock spectral sunset all i did was if you go in in the atmosphere editor you can go into sun and you can just uh, go into all these different settings for the sun um, all the different you know technical settings but if you go to effects you'll see this ice rings box now if you look closely you'll see this huge halo that the sun creates uh, that's something that's created high up in the atmosphere when the sun con condenses um, the atmospheric uh, vapors but then because it's so cold they just freeze right away again usually you'll see it more north um, and what that's called is an ice ring and that's right here I just checked this box the intensity uh, about 20 if you make that really oops if you make that really high and uh, you'll see it gets a lot larger the sun begins to be more um, obscured by the by the ice in the atmosphere but essentially that's what that is is the ice in the atmosphere uh, caused by condensation refreezing and then back and forth back and forth and there's a few different different kinds you can, and I might be wrong about that if I'm wrong comment on the tutorial and correct me I'm not by any means a meteorologist so um, there's a few different kinds here uh, I found that uh, pillar usually looks nice um, but just experiment with those other two and see what you can come up with okay I'm not gonna go through too much of the other settings here I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of this so you can kinda run with it and get what you're looking for um, okay let's move on now to our ecosystem like I said um, in order to get an ecosystem on the ground plane and get it the way I wanted it to look I didn't actually use the default stock ground plane that comes when you open the software what I did is I stretched out a, a a generated terrain you get that by just going up here create terrain and then you have a few different kinds here and um, I just created one and stretched it out and squashed it down so it was flat and then if you go in here you'll see all of your ecosystem settings now again like I said before it's good to have a lot of randomness because in nature you'll see very little uniformity so what I've done is I've created um, a lot of different trees in this case four different types of trees and I've just left all their presence at one now that's just default I think and that just means that there's that it's just gonna spread it evenly uh, across the, the terrain and um, and the presence will be will be even all the way through and it'll be full however when you have numerous different kinds at full presence what you'll have is an even distribution of all of those different things and the more you have consequently the more randomness you'll have which is a good thing uh, if you look on CG Society on my portfolio there what you'll see is my older works in view you'll see just I used like maybe one or two different kinds and and tried to adjust the presence around and I find that's what a lot of new view users will do is is they put maybe two kinds of trees and then what they do is they'll just kind of make this one you know 0.25 presence and this one at one 
because they want more of this one, less of this one, and whatnot. But what you get is just really uniform uh, ecosystems, and it it never looks photoreal. It will always look fake. Um, so even if you only put a few of these large dead trees, um, still that few you know adds that bit of dynamism that can make your image photoreal or not. Uh, so it's always good to have a lot of extras. You know, even if there's just one or two of them, stick them in there because randomness is always good, um, and you never want uniformity. I'm gonna, you know, press that home a lot in this in this kind of uh, overview here because it's so important. Okay, so the general parameters in the uh, in the uh, ecosystem role or uh, flyout or whatever you call this box here is. Uh, pretty self-explanatory. Now the underlying material is kind of the base material that's applied underneath of all the trees, houses, objects, whatever it is you apply. The underlying material is that base material. And you can see in this box here that the sphere, um, if you're familiar with any 3D applications, 3D Max for example, you'll you'll understand that in the material editors you always have that you know base material that's applied to the sphere that's what same thing here and you'll see down here you'll have these little trees that's how you know an ecosystem is applied and what's um, usually there's not a very good representation of what you have because obviously it can't fit them all in there but this underlying material usually you know it's good to have grass or or, or something that you would find on a forest floor um, because that's exactly what it represents. Um, and then, um, if you see, if I move up, you've, I've in my underlying material, I have actually two materials, uh, grass and forest, which is this one, but I also have, then it automatically adds bump and different things like that as you apply different uh, ecosystem properties, like density. Now, um, the density is it's going to take all of your trees here and it's going to you see dense or sparse pretty self-explanatory um, depending on what you want and depending on you know your scene will depend on how dense or how sparse you have them um, and again placement same kind of self-explanatory sampling quality depending on your machine will depend on where you have that um, now, the important things, however, in this particular scene, which are really key in, uh, in getting the look that we're going for, you can see that on these peaks right here on the edges, there's really no trees. But yet, right here, you can see that they're very, very dense and populated, and there's just a lot of them. Um, now, the way to achieve that um, is, let me select my... thing and come to its you can see I have a different material applied here because I'm actually going you know for more detail and it's going to be exposed a little bit so in the scaling and orientation it's very very important uh, to just tweak that and get it exactly what you're going for and in this specific scene let me see if I can get uh, it's gonna overlap well anyway you can see here um, we have this material and then but another thing, this actually is a very small scene. And the way I've kind of faked this huge expanse, as you can see in the overall scaling right here, is I've got it pretty small. Now, usually it defaults at about middle. Um, and that's actually very, very huge uh, for this scene. Um, because, like I said, it's for a, fake, it's for a, you know, a fake still shot. So it's, it's really important to work around everything you can for speed and, uh, and things like that. Okay, so I have my overall scaling really, really small. And then I also have my proportions uniformed because if I were to make those non-uniformed for a fake scene like this, well, what I would get is some trees that would be like 200 feet tall, at least in proportion to the scene we're working with, and then other trees that were like minuscule in size comparatively. So I've got my size pretty uniformed. In fact, 100% uniformed. Now, direction from surface is important for this scene because you can see here how on these cliffs, they kind of, they kind of grow upwards. But yet, um, if you're if you're familiar with how a uh, tree would grow on a cliff, you know, in reality, you know it kind of comes perpendicular, 
with the surface but it also kind of grows you know horizontal to it it comes out a bit and then up so what I've done to fake that is you'll see direction from surface right here about 61 percent seem to work perfectly to get these little trees to look as if they're growing out and then kind of up uh, which if you can see here it worked pretty nicely and it looks pretty real and uh, the rotation kind of the same thing um, it just limits the rotation but uh, what's very very important here is the environment um, scaling and orientation really important environment this is really important for this scene as well because I didn't want the trees to be growing in certain parts of the of the scene so what I had to do is limit where they grow and and that's um, you know fairly easy actually with views uh, ecosystem editor because what I have here is I can constrain in all these different different ty types here my orientation slope and altitude which is really really handy you can see when it comes to my altitude constraint you have two arrows and that's the same with slope constraint two arrows the only one that's different is the orientation constraint uh, we'll get to that and why that is in it just a bit okay but the two arrows in altitude constraint the bottom this represents the lowest altitude that the trees or whatever it is in your ecosystem is allowed to grow or is allowed to be placed this represents the highest altitude you know obviously respective to your scene so I have obviously you know I set it to it's usually you want it to be set all the way up unless you're dealing with uh, mountains let's say where you don't want trees to grow at the high at high altitudes um, because you know there's not enough oxygen things like that it's too cold um, but what I also did is I didn't want it I didn't want the trees to grow on these mountains below too much below the cloud level so I cut it off at about just above the bottom and what that did is allowed me to if you see it allowed me uh, to if you look here as it gets down towards the clouds it kind of uh, I guess you could say fades off the way that's achieved is you'll see here fuzziness top and bottom essentially what that's doing is creating a gradient in the distribution map so it, I set this to by object that means it, it takes these settings and applies them to the entire object that the ecosystem is applied to therefore when I apply a fuzziness or a, I guess you could say I, I feather the gradient more on the bottom of the object it distributes those uh, accordingly so at the bottom of that object you can see th it begins to become more and more sparse in its density and its population that's because as you go down farther I've constrained that altitude so it uh, it's a really handy little tool to deal with these things quickly rather than you know hand painting all of these different things on there which I really hate doing most people would look at a scene like this and think that you know you've got all of these these little trees here and stuff you know a lot of people would go about that you know and hand paint a tree exactly where they want them to be but the reason that you can get this nice looking result here without having the tedious you know work of hand painting those things in there is because you can slope constrain these as well so bring that back up here and um, let me move this over a bit and then bring my image back okay so you have a slope range now the same kind of concept is with the altitude constraint except with a slope that this is uh, this is uh, flat completely flat I'm, I think and this is com this is at the other end would be you know completely you know 90 degrees up and down um, so vertical would be completely vertical so what I've done is in order to get this kind of fuzzy look in this sparsely populated look on these on this cliff because you know obviously trees don't grow as well on a cliff as they do on flat ground like this what I've done is I've just I brought the constraint level up to about midway so that trees won't grow at all on this 90 degree platform or this 90 degree cliff here however there's a few that do grow there and the reason I how I achieved that is I took my flat and steep fuzziness and brought it up just a bit which again just as it would do in the altitude constraint it, it kind of feathers that that distribution gradient more and you know allows trees to be there so um, just a few ended up there which is it gives it that um, if you know anything about view you can also hand paint 
these trees and these objects in there it gives it that tedious hand painted look when in fact you've only just messed around with the um, with the distribution map and the gradient constraints um, now I won't lie it you know it took a lot of tweaking and a lot of work uh, to get the ecosystem to do this right here um, so don't expect to get these results even even using all my same settings right here don't expect to get these same results quickly it does take work it does take experience and it does take knowledge of the software uh, to get you know photorealism and to get to get nice results what I'm what my goal here is to give you the knowledge you need to feed your creativity uh, in order to you know push you on further with the software because you know there's really only a few different places you can find good tutorials for view and a lot of them are just uh, you know pointed towards one thing so that's kind of my goal here just so you know okay and orientation constraint what this does um, is it just if you look at, at this I didn't I don't really use that at all as you can see I've got it zeroed out on everything I'm not really too sure as to what it does exactly um, it never seems to change things much or it just messes things up so I usually zero it right out um, my guess is it constrains your orientation whether it be vertical or horizontal against the surface of the object uh, material or whatever it is that you might have um, let me redo that here Uh, whether you have object material or the absolute can um, check there it will constrain the orientation you know depending on that so uh, it's just I don't really use it too much you might find a use for it but um, I I haven't personally okay so that's kind of a basic overview of uh, the ecosystem settings that I use to create this scene and how I and, and again key to faking these huge scenes is to always look at the overall density and then also if you go to scaling the overall scaling because a really highly you know densely populated ecosystem with a low scale is obviously going to make something look a lot larger and a lot more expansive than it actually is and that's how you get you know large looking scenes with low poly comparatively low poly counts okay so that's uh you know it's pretty self-explanatory but a lot of people don't really dive into it um, as deeply as they should when it comes to that that kind of thing okay so when it comes to render settings now that's really important as well because your render settings especially in a view scene like this they can make or break your 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 scene so I'm gonna go to my render options tab here and let me just explain some of these render settings because a lot of people uh, really get kind of mixed around they end up with like 10 hour render times when they don't need to so render optimization is extremely important um, even on I've been on the view forums and, and even on there you'll have people come on and they say how do I do this you know it took me 10 hours to render this this scene and it's, it's you know not even as complicated as this one that we've got here and uh, the render time I think for this took about uh, around 10 minutes but that's to get this level of detail right here um, and that's you know pretty decent for 10 minutes rendering um, mental ray would take you know hours to get that level of detail in the trees um, and so my render settings are pretty easy now you have presets um, as you go through the presets here you'll you'll see OpenGL which is if you you know I'll render right now with OpenGL you'll see it's exactly like the viewport looks see if it's gonna go slow because of Camtasia yeah see it, it's just all it does is it takes the viewport and it gives you a representation very quickly very just sloppily very easily of what you get in the viewport because the viewport too is you know real-time OpenGL rendering um, so that's you know very very rarely used unless you're doing quick previews and stuff uh, preview is what you get when you hit the little button a little camera button here you'll get a preview render of the viewport same thing um, now you have final now you look as you toggle through these things some different things get checked here um, and a lot of these are really important 
Final, you, you'll use that for tests, I think, as well. Um, usually it gives you kind of a flat look in the trees. Um, it makes them look like cards um, rather than, uh, or sprites, I guess, rather than um, actual 3D objects. Um, the best settings I've found for huge expanses like this, if you're not doing stuff, obviously, for like productions and stuff that's on a budget with huge render farms and distributed rendering and stuff like that, a good some good stuff I found is uh, to take the broadcast um, and just leave it at default um, or to look at your broadcast settings you see what you've got here and go to user settings because there's a few things you don't need um, like if you go to ultra you'll see all this stuff here everything is checked now but you'll notice really quickly here you're calculating motion blur depth of field blurred transparency, blurred reflections, and all of these different things that you don't need. So a lot of the times it's good to go into user settings and then go through and see what you have for like broadcast. You've got all this stuff. So go through and just uncheck what you don't need. Um, and don't be don't be scared of unchecking something because you think you might need it. If you obvious if you you see it and you obviously don't need it, you don't need it. Like motion blur, you don't need it for a still scene obviously um, technically you don't even need it for a moving scene because there's so many third-party ways to add motion blur nowadays uh, in composite and in post that you don't need to add motion blur in 3d much anymore unless it's complicated um, and that the reason for that is it just takes so long to render and really in this scene I wouldn't even need depth of field you can do it in Photoshop um, so these things aren't necessary in rendering um, and a lot of people check these things because they want it you know to look the best that they can have it look which is you know valid but it's just going to make your render time render time skyrocket and you don't want that you want to be you want to have quality but you want to also balance that quality with um, efficiency and with you know a, a quick workflow or as quick as you can get it so I never use motion blur or depth of field in view I very rarely if ever if I think I've only done two or three animations in view um, I usually so I usually never use motion blur or depth of field just uncheck those and do it in Photoshop if you don't know how to do it in Photoshop it'll take you less time to go find a tutorial on it than it would to render that stuff in view to be completely honest okay other things like take a look at this scene do we need you know blurred reflections no, we don't. There's nothing reflecting. There's no water. Um, because blurred reflections and blurred transparency are essentially for water. If you have water in your scene, or if you're doing like an underwater scene, or something like that, you want to have those checked, obviously. But for this scene, it would just, you know, it just adds unnecessary calculations to the rendering. It's just going to slow things way down when you don't really need to. Um, shadows yes you want to uh, you, you want to have soft shadows checked that's kind of a necessity because if you only have hard shadows it's gonna look horrible super sampling um, that kind of gets really deep into the rather than going um, pixel by pixel it's going to it's going to calculate at a sub pixel level usually that's good to have checked uh, again when it comes to the you know the deep technicalities of all that I could be wrong so correct me in the comments but super sampling is, uh, I'm pretty sure, sub pixel sampling. Um, and it's good to have that. It doesn't really speed up or slow down your render too much. Um, now, these ray tracing uh, things are pretty important. You, you want ray trace you want you want it to trace the rays you want light to bounce. If you don't have any of these checked, you're not really going to have um, you know you're just gonna have your light hit the thing and stop you want it to be you want it to bounce around and to be uh, realistic in that regard so you want to have those those checked and you can edit some different things right here your subray options um, usually you see five is just fine you know most people would they just say oh well I want it to look good so I'm gonna crank this way up that necess not necessarily is the is the best way to go about it because sometimes you can bring it down to like nine and you're not going to have much of a visible difference between 9 and 32, to be completely honest. Okay, and there's all these other things uh, that you can go through. Um, I just used, I think, stock broadcast, and I, yeah, I think that was it. But um, 
rent the there's a few other optimizations that a lot of people overlook that's right here anti-aliasing um, if you don't do that what you're gonna get is really hard jagged lines in places where like let's say you have texture let's say it's stretched a bit or it's or it's you know compressed a bit or you just have some odd deformation in that texture that's going to bring out you know some stair stepping or some some odd looking things on the edges you know let's say where your mountain hits the sky now even in this if you look here if you look really close you can see some stair stepping right here that's because I didn't anti-alias my objects um, I did that because this was a, a tutorial example image and I didn't want it to take forever but I could have avoided that by object anti-aliasing and texture anti-aliasing what that does is it smooths out all of those hard edges like right here where my object meets the sky if I would have used anti-aliasing I would have gotten rid of that uh, that hard looking edge as it meets the sky or the cloud layer um, because what it does is it just blurs those pixels um, because you're working at, you know at only a certain pixel amount depending on what resolution you use so anti-aliasing will take your pixel amount and it will blur that accordingly in order to get rid of all of those uh, all of those um, you know stair stepping and hard lines and things like that and you know that's common common knowledge if you're familiar with Photoshop or anything like that so render settings are really important and remember a key to rendering in view do not use what you don't have to use um, or else you'll get 10 hour render times and then complain about view because your renders take so long when in fact it's your fault trust me I was there I know exactly how that is um, another good thing to do is to clear your OpenGL I think by default that's checked but it might not be um, but make sure this is checked clear OpenGL data before render because that's gonna that's going to uh, free up some more memory for you to use in your rendering which can speed things up uh, maybe minutely but you'll see, you could possibly see a difference and the advanced effects quality is all of these things here um, and like ray tracing you know sub ray quality anti-aliasing all of those uh, things that are that are not default and that you tweak are considered advanced effects so the quality is usually you know to crank that right up again isn't really wise uh, because you know what you're gonna have is just outstandingly long render times when you really could put it about half see no visible difference you know and have quicker renders so that's just a brief overview uh, kind of the render settings that I used for this scene and kind of some keys and tips for tweaking your renders um, when it comes to the specific objects I just use default objects and it all depends again on your rendering uh, how uh, how much quality you can bring out of those objects alright and um, I think that's about it um, Hopefully, I'll be able to do some more tutorials on Vue later on and actually take you through some real-time scene creation. So, um, be sure to stay tuned for more tutorials. And my name's Evan Scheibel uh, with CG Toots Plus. And uh, thanks for watching, guys. I hope you learned something. Um, hey, if this was a bad tutorial, hey, tell me about it. I'm <laughs> glad to hear. Uh, but if it was good, hey, show me what you've come up with. And, uh, and, uh, you know post on the comments and keep watching thanks a lot